All right, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Living with Lymphoma podcast series brought to you by the Lymphoma Research Foundation. I'm your host, uh, Victor Gonzalez. Uh, this series is devoted to discussing matters important to those touched by a lymphoma diagnosis. Um, and this particular episode is a special edition of Living with Lymphoma discussing CAR T cell therapy uh, and other novel agents as well. A video version of this episode will be available on the Lymphoma Research Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, we're here today with uh, Robin Stacy Humphreys, a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma survivor who was a recipient of CAR T-cell therapy. And we also have Dr. Andrew Evans, uh, the Associate Director for Clinical Services and Medical Director of the Oncology Service Line uh, for our, uh, WJ Barnabas Health and Director of the Lymphoma Program at Rutgers Cancer Institute in New Jersey. Um, he's also a member of the uh, LRF Scientific Advisory Board. So thank you both so much for being here today. Um, how are you both doing? I'm doing well. Um, at, you know, a little weather here and there, but otherwise we're, we're navigating things well. I'm doing well. The uh, hurricane passed by the south already, so no significant damage. And we have sun, so this is great. Well, it's great to hear. I'm, I'm quite jealous. Yeah, it seems like we're in the middle here uh, in the northeast of uh, Hurricane Isaias or wherever it's pronounced, right? But uh, well, we'll do what we can. <laughs> um, but that's great to hear. Um, and, you know, just for a little bit of background, um, as some of you might know, I, I oversee our helpline. And I think over the past few years, one of the things that we've really been hearing about from patients is just a really high level of interest in some of these new cellular therapies in the context of treating diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, I think. Um, there have been so many new treatment options for this particular population, um, and we're hearing them become much more of a bulk group, whereas in the past, um, you know, perhaps they, many of them would have been told, oh, you know, our job is what you'll get, and that's pretty much it. And then, you know, oftentimes you're surprised, right, if, if, when they do relapse and then have conversations there um, or at that point. But now with the advent of CAR T-cell therapy for lymphoma, um, you know, it's an exciting time, I think, for, for the treatment landscape. Um, and patients still want to learn more about it, when it might be more appropriate for them, and also what the experience is like for those who have had it. Um, and you know, I think we'll, doc, we'll start with you, Dr. Evans, you know, if, if you don't mind just telling us a little bit what CAR-T stands for, what it is. Um, and you know, since we also know that it's a type of immunotherapy, if you can describe a little bit about what that term means as well. Sure. And Victor, thank you and to LRF for putting this together. I think these educational webcasts used to be in person, but at least we were finding a way to get this on with you So, yeah, I think it would not be too much of a, a word to say it really is revolutionary therapy. Uh, it really was a significant breakthrough. And so what is CAR T-cell therapy? So the CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor, and the T is T-cell therapy. And, you know, for so many decades, we've treated not just lymphoma, but many cancers with chemotherapy. And it still is effective. You mentioned RCHOP, and that is still very important for, for many people with newly diagnosed diffuse large B-cell. But there are some cases, unfortunately, that can relapse, becomes resistant. In the past, what did we have at our disposal was really just more chemotherapy. And again, not to diminish chemotherapy, it still is important and effective in certain cases. But where we started to scratch the surface was in 1997 with rituximab. So that is a way that it is a monoclonal antibody that targets B cells. So we're starting to scratch the immunotherapy surface. Well, now fast forward 20 years. And so where CAR T cell therapy takes it to another level is that we've known for actually um, many years that one of the reasons patients can get cancer, there's many reasons, one of them is the T cells. So T as in Tom, T cells, they fight infection, but they also fight cancer. And cancer cells and lymphoma cells sometimes can be very smart, and they find a way to basically block, shield themselves from the patient's own immune system, the T cells, to attack them, to get at them. And so what it really is, uh, kind of the revolutionary part was, okay, acknowledging that was then saying, okay, how can we actually take the patient's own immune system, which isn't working good enough because the lymphoma is growing, take it out of the body, and basically over a three to five week period, make it stronger, and then even attach, or do the word is transfect, an antibody on the T cell. Antibodies are usually on B cells. 
So it's basically kind of giving it double technology, making it stronger. They kind of supercharge it and then tell it where to go and then basically reinfuse it like a blood transfusion. Um, I mean, that's the quick explanation. There's obviously more details to that. But I can tell you the data with what I just described, that process over the three to five week period, took many situations that were bleak, to say the best. And with chemotherapy, maybe at a five to 10% chance and more than quadrupled the chances of going in remission and potentially being cured. Yeah, that's amazing. I think, you know, that data is what's coming across to a lot of patients. Maybe that, you know, the savvier person is doing a little bit of research and maybe they've relapsed and they wanted to see what, you know, the next best option might be. Um, you know, we're seeing from patients across the board, right? And, and you know, would you mind sharing at this point, you know, what is, what subtypes is uh, um, CAR-T approved for? So as of today, there's two types. As of two weeks ago, it was one type, so we garnered a recent new approval. So there are currently mm -hmm. two FDA-approved agents um, that are, are FDA-approved for relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, those are the first two that garnered market in relapsed diffuse large B-cell. I take that back. There is an approval in relapsed pediatric ALL, acute lymphoblastic oh, right. lymphoma. So we've had these two approvals. The diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in adults. And we can talk more about later, but as of a couple weeks ago, now in relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma, we have a CAR T cell that is approved as well. That's right. We can't we can't forget that approval, which is also um, you know exciting for for uh, the treatment landscape in mantle cell lymphomas. I think um, you know that's an area that's always needed. Um, you know, much more research and advancements as well. And we've come quite a number of uh, strides, I think, in the past few years in that group as well. Um, and just shifting a little bit, you know, Robin, you received CAR T cell therapy, um, and I'm wondering, in, which we'll talk about more in, in detail in a minute, but I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what was happening to you um, prior to you receiving this treatment. For example, let's go back from when you were diagnosed. What were you experiencing? What were your symptoms? Um, and what tr treatment options did you just receive first? Um, so I was originally diagnosed in 2011. I was 48 years old. And I'll add that I'm a practicing physician as well, and I'm a radiologist. And actually, when I was diagnosed, I wasn't having any symptoms, but I noticed that I had an enlarged lymph node above my clavicle, which is uh, a very abnormal place to have a lymph node and is usually associated with other cancers like breast cancers and lung cancers. Um, but we found out that very shortly that I had diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, I did get some different opinions, but at that point it was pretty standard of care that I would receive our chop. It was a standard of care and it, you know, a cure rate of up to 80% or so was expected. And actually I was a super responder. I responded very quickly and I was in remission within three months, but I then completed my six uh, cycles of our chop, which is standard of therapy. And then a uh, caveat is I actually worked through chemotherapy. Um, I had to alter my schedule somewhat just to receive the medication. Um, even though the chemotherapy was unpleasant, uh, I was not, I, I did very well and was able to exercise and work through all of that. Um, I was in remission for four years after our chop and most of my physician thought that, you know, I was probably going to be in the clear, but then my lymphoma relapsed. And once again, I had no symptoms. I noticed an enlarged lymph node in my neck. Uh, at that point, once you failed standard therapy, you go into salvage chemotherapy and you start looking at other options. And I received three different opinions that I should proceed with an autologous stem cell transplant. Before that, I received something called R-ICE. It was salvage chemotherapy, standard of care, but I also had to receive intrathecal chemotherapy uh, because some of the uh, tumor had been around my nose and they were concerned that I could get it in my brain. Um, wasn't a lot of fun. And then I proceeded for a stem cell transplant using agent called beam, which is a uh, standard of care, very difficult. It's, uh, it destroys your blood marrow, bone marrow. And I was in the hospital for three weeks, but I actually suffered septic shock. So I was in the intensive care unit due to line, line sepsis. It was a very difficult experience, uh, high fever, delirious. Um, but I got out of the hospital and then the other caveat was it was recommended that I have head and neck radiation after this because I had relapsed in my neck. 
at that point, after head and neck radiation, I was unable to eat solid food for three months. I lost uh, most of my muscle mass in spite of trying to exercise. I was unable to work for three months. Uh, I had a lot of mucositis, a lot of um, nausea, uh, difficult times, but I'm a survivor. And I went back to work and everything was going fine. I was in remission for nine months. And then the lymphoma came back once again. And once again, all I did was fill an enlarged lymph node in my neck. Um, at that point, I really didn't have that many options. Uh, my transplant oncologist, who is very well known and, and good friend now, recommended that I go for an allogeneic transplant, which was the standard of care. I had been a responder. I'd always responded. He thought I'd do well. But the caveat was, in spite of my appearance, I actually have a multi-ethnic background and I'm an only child. So I actually had no match, um, not even close, except I had a haplo match with my son. But I'd been reading about CAR T cell therapy and I had no interest in having an allogeneic uh, transplant. But this was in 2016. There were, they'd only had a phase one trial with Novartis that had had about a 40% remission rate and that was 12 patients. So I banked everything on that and we started looking for a clinical trial in the United States and I was lucky enough to get a spot. Uh, at that point though, we didn't really talk about survival rates, but the standard therapy would be that if I had not received therapy, I had six months to live at that point. Um, so I have three kids, um, and so it was tough. So I, but I went ahead and researched CAR T cell therapy, and I'll leave it at that. Wow, what a, what a fascinating story! And it sounds like you know you've been through you've been through quite a bit, right? And yes, and just the the idea of the sepsis and just sepsis, all the different side effects. I'm sure a lot of patients experience and things that you don't necessarily hear about, right? You usually just hear about the outcomes, not necessarily the experiences you've been through. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that, and I'm wondering. You know, maybe we could level set a little bit. If I can ask you, Dr. Evans, if you can kind of describe a little bit, you know, what diffuse RGB cell lymphoma is, you know, and, you know, the diagnosis that, that Robin had. Um, and explain a little bit to, you know, some folks who maybe might not be familiar with it, um, you know, and what it means when your disease becomes relapsed refractory and, and maybe some of the additional uh, treatments that Robin had, like what an autologous trans stem cell transplant is and what allogeneic refers to as well. Sure. No, she did a great job explaining it. So I'll, I'll try to, to add in. But yeah, in fact, I did telemedicine all morning here uh, from home. So I actually explained this multiple times. But I think it's important <laughs> to explain it because we think of lymphoma, you know, like many cancers, there's one type, a couple subtypes. But as we talk about, when you do a biopsy of a lymph node, why it's so critical, there's more than 70 different types, all treatable but different treatments. It was a this type, that type, this type. You can group them into two categories, even though each one is a little different. And we have an indolent lymphomas and then the more aggressive. And diffuse large B cell would fall into the aggressive, which sounds bad, but the upside of being an aggressive lymphoma is with initial therapy like our CHOP or sometimes a regimen called EPOC, the goal is not just to treat it, put in remission, you're trying to cure it. Actually, every time you treat most times you treat diffuse large B cell, the hope is not just to put it in remission, but to cure it. You know, go away, never come back. And so you hope, you, you know it's not 100% with initial therapy. It is the majority of patients. Our science isn't quite there yet to say, you know, if we knew who the 20, 30% initially, well, we would give different therapy. So everyone will receive the initial treatment. There can be a relapse. And what a relapse means is it usually is within the first two years of diagnosis. So it can go in remission, usually takes about four or five months. And then over the next 18 months, there can be some resistant cells that start to grow. So you can't give the same therapy. They're resistant. And you have to give new treatment. The standard for 50 years has been for a first relapse, you give new chemo and then a stem cell autologous transplant. And what that really is, it's not like getting a new immune system, which also Robin talked about from another person. That's an allogeneic. We are doing those less often. They're pretty tricky. An autologous transplant is really one cycle of very high-dose chemo, and it only works if the disease is shrunk down. So she received a common treatment ice to try to shrink it and then come in with the one-time high-dose chemo transplant. 
And then again, these are all numbers. Every patient is unique. But if we have, you know, kind of look back over hundreds and thousands of patients, that works in about half of the time. But then, you know, you, know, you kind of, there can be another relapse. And, and Robin really uh, gave her case uh, very eloquently. And so I can tell you historically, what would we do? We'd give more chemo. Well, if the first two chemo didn't work, what's the likelihood of third? Unfortunately, not very high. And so when we have new breakthrough therapies like CAR T-cell, as well as some other ones, frankly, that uh, are really in the pipeline, new immunotherapy targeting different things, um, it really is a big breakthrough. And so all of what I was just describing, by the way, Victor, of the initial diagnosis, autotransplant, and now CAR T-cell is for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It, that paradigm is different for other subtypes of lymphoma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a very important distinction to make because uh, I think, you know, what we've been seeing is when patients contact us, they might have a different subtype. They want to know what, what, at what point, you know, CAR T-cell therapy might be appropriate for them, you know, and at that point right now, at least before the mantle cell uh, approval uh, just recently, we would talk more about clinical trials for them, right? Make sure that they're aware that there may be trials that might be appropriate for them, um, even if their lymphoma subtype isn't approved to receive it. And Robin, you know, you received it in that context, right? Um, You know, and and I think we hear quite a bit also from patients about a hesitation of going going forward with something like an allogeneic stem cell transplant um, and concerns around that. And I I am wondering when this rec or when the clinical trial was recommended to you, you know, do you know why your doctor suggested it? Did they talk to you about the data or what was that conversation like? Um, Well, this is where this is unusual. My doctor did not recommend CAR-T. Matter of mm-hmm. fact, they uh, told me not to have it. Uh, that was this was in 2016, though. They only had a right. phase one trial. Um, I have to admit, I just had a feeling this was what was right for me. And given the fact that again, I have a multi ethnic background, um, and I just I am a doctor. I, I knew what my numbers would be with an allogeneic transplant, and also I. I really, really enjoy my work. I work full time as a physician. This is my passion. I, I wanted to go back to work. Um, so I actually researched the CAR-T trials. And at the time, there were no uh, spots available. And there is a site that anyone in the United States can access, www.clinicaltrials.gov, and put in your diagnosis, put in uh, a lot of other information, and find out what you match up with. As it turned out, because I was sick enough to qualify for a trial, but healthy otherwise, no comorbidities. I actually qualified for all the trials, but there were no spots. So we actually personally emailed every single researcher throughout the United States and a couple in Europe trying to get a spot. And we were really, really lucky that about two two to three weeks into that search, we found a spot opened up in a different state. And so once the spot opened up, I talked to the uh, researcher, which could be, you know, Dr. like Dr. Evans, who and I will say I've talked to researchers across the United States. They were wonderful. And they said, why don't you fly in, bring your records and we'll take a look. I flew in, uh, looked at the records. I qualified. They signed me up that day um, and it was off to the races. So, yeah, no, that's amazing. And. You know, I think that's a really good example of you being your own self-advocate, right? And just going for what you felt was appropriate for you. And that's certainly something that we try to do in the patients that we work with. I'm also glad you mentioned clinicaltrials.gov. You know, that's um, basically the registry that we use at the Lymphoma Research Foundation for our own navigation, clinical trial navigation program called the Clinical Trials Information Service, where we do some of the legwork for patients, where, you know, we do a little bit of an assessment with them, gather some information, their diagnosis and treatment history, um, and do the searches for them. Because, you know, anything that we feel would make it easier for patients to be connected with clinical trials, um, Dr. Evans, I'm sure you agree, just the, the importance of making sure that patients are aware of um, you know, the latest research being potentially available for them and beneficial to them um, and, and considering them as part of a treatment option, you know, something that we always try to make sure that we, um, or there's the message that we get across, you know, because then as you see for you, it's been life-saving, right? <laughs> well, and I think, Victor, and there's always different situations for clinical trials, and we could do a whole lot mm-hmm. of obviously, on clinical trials, but yeah. yeah, the situation Robin was in was a tough one, and so that was looking for hopefully a silver bullet. We didn't know it. We, we had some early data. It looked really good. 
Um, yeah. In other situations, for example, um, many of these drugs, not just CAR T, they usually first get approved for the relapse situation, kind of you know, kind of down the road. There's equipoise on pros and cons. But just like rituximab, rituximab first got approved for relapse refractory indolent lymphoma in 1997. That's where it started, but it didn't stay there. It quickly, over the next several years, moved all the way up to the front line for indolent, where we added it to chemotherapy, and then you had to test it in diffuse large B-cell. Because even though it works in one, in relapsed, it doesn't mean it works earlier in newly diagnosed. We always have to check safety and efficacy. So rituximab made it all the way up basically across every B-cell lymphoma. CAR-T has a few more side effects than rituximab, but we already have finished, we don't know the results yet, a clinical trial. So just where Robin mentioned at the point where she had an autologous stem cell transplant, there was a head-to-head -head study uh, that's been done for first relapse comparing the standard autologous stem cell transplant to CAR-T. There's actually more than one study. There's another study that's still ongoing with the two approved products. So we don't know. You know, we're hopeful that it'll beat it, but we'll have to see. So it's trying to slowly make its way earlier. So when we say clinical trials, it's basically saying, what's the standard of care right now, and how can we either replace it or make it better? Um, you know, for a lot of patients, that's really, you know, top of mind in, in terms of at what point can they get it? Can they get it earlier, right? So to hear that head-to-head -head trial, it'll be really interesting to see what the results are, because I think for a lot of patients um, in the beginning, they're like, can I get this front line? Right. Um, and, you know, we have to explain to them there's a whole process for, for anything to get to that point. And just as you, you know, so like when you said about rituxin um, and now rituxin is a mainstay of, uh, you know, any NHL or B cell NHL treatment. Right. Um, and, you know, and Robin, from your perspective, I'm wondering, you know, Dr. Evans went into a little bit about what the process was like to uh, develop and create the CAR T cells. What's it like from your perspective? You know, what, what is it that you were expecting? What did it feel like? Um, and what was going through your mind? Um, well, uh, I was nervous and excited. I really thought this was probably my best shot. Um, but I have to admit, I'm sort of a walking uh, experiment in many ways. Because I signed up so early, uh, there were some lab delays. And I also received uh, another uh, inhibitor, a BTK inhibitor called abrutinib as a bridging chemotherapy, which was uh, used off-label, and now has been established as being very effective, particularly in my subtype of uh, lymphoma, which is called an ABC subtype. Um, so I received that as well, and it was actually effective and put me in remission, but it, the study shows that it would not have cured me. But um, when my T cells were ready, uh, the whole process was just so much easier. Uh, there's, they give you a lymphocyte depleting chemotherapy. And in my case, I actually got to get a one day treatment. Most of the treatments are three days and it's up to the doctors to decide what's best for them. Um, and then I had this T cell infusion, which was all of 10 minutes. Uh, I had about 20 people in our room, my room, cause I was one of the first people to get this. It was like a big celebration. Uh, and they infused these T cells and then we sat around and waited. But I cannot tell you, I, you know, I didn't have much side effects to begin with, had a little low grade fever. But by that point, I had lymph nodes in my neck and one in my groin and one in my armpit that was that were growing pretty rapidly because I had been off therapy for a while. And within 24 hours of receiving CAR T therapy, these lymph nodes started to melt uh, like ice cubes and they were gone clinically within one week, um, which was amazing. So uh, it, it was very miraculous feeling. I have to admit, it felt like a medical miracle. And of course, all of my uh, doctors were extremely excited because <laughs> I was early in the trial. Um, and so afterwards, I did get uh, the side effect that I'm sure Dr. Evans is going to talk about. I did get a, um, some cytokine release syndrome, but my term, tumor burden was relatively low compared to some people. But I had cytokine release syndrome between days five and days eight. So I was only in the hospital for four days, the first day of infusion, then days five through eight. And I had a high fever of 104 and I had low blood pressure and I felt pretty lousy. Uh, but they gave me fluids. And at that point, only Tylenol. And I was able to go home 
and I had to stay within my trial area. We had a, a VRBO flat, so I had to be with within 30 minutes of the hospital for 30 days. And I went in every day, and then every every day, every every fifth day for blood work, and then went home. And I was back at work in four weeks. Pretty amazing. Although it's part time, I started part time. That's still that's really amazing. You know, I mean, considering all you had been through up to that point. <laughs> You know, and all the different things that your body had been dealing with and also mentally, right, I think to get to that point, um, to be able to go back to work and, and to feel like you had that motivation, I think is, is, is amazing. Right. Um, and, you know, b- before we get to the to the side effects, um, you know, you mentioned something I think is very important um, that you were diagnosed with a certain subtype of DLBCL. You said it, ABC subtype. Right. Um, and Dr. Evans, I was wondering if, you know, I think we're talking about cell of origin here, right? And I think that's really important for a lot of patients to know. And if you can explain a little bit about what those, you know, subtypes are, because we're learning that DLBCL is really a heterogeneous disease, right? Um, and how that might, um, you know, affect someone's outcome and what the treatment implications might be. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, what I would say is we're continuing to learn on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. We've known about cell of origin. For over 10 years, and that's even at diagnosis. Um, One other way to kind of describe it is we can divide it into germinal center and non-germinal center. That was like the first. And another synonym for non-germinal center is activated B-cell type, ABC. Sometimes they're interchangeable. But what we're learning, not surprisingly, is it's not that simple. There's been some really seminal publications and research in part out of the National Cancer Institute, also Dana-Farber that have really said, wait a minute, there are multiple subsets. And what, and what I'm saying is, is these are actually genetic subsets. So just like they do DNA testing at a crime scene, we do DNA, RNA testing of lymph, lymphoma cells. Uh, they do it for other cancers. But it's looking, it's not like you do it and uh, I pick it up. It's looking for needles and haystacks. And it's a big haystack when you're looking through lymphoma. And you're not just trying to find any needle. What's the needle that makes this lymphoma grow? Because if I can find the needle or needles that make the lymphoma grow, then can I design a drug to go after it? And so we, there have been some really good, interesting publications, for example, BTK inhibitors that was mentioned, that if it's active in diffuse source B-cell lymphoma, it may likely be more active in the non-germinal center or activated B-cell type. And then there's some other drugs. It's never 100% one way or another. But it's just so exciting to see all this bench, because all that genetic molecular research and breakthroughs I'm I'm talking about are in the laboratory. And as you know, sometimes it doesn't always translate to the bedside. So we, of course, always have to say great, fascinating data in the laboratory. How does it translate to patients? And so we're we're really looking at that. One other thing I'll mention, too, is is there are some other subtypes of diffuse RH B-cell lymphoma. Another way to look at the molecular is something called a Uh, double hit or triple hit. I had a patient this morning on telemedicine. That usually refers to an oncogene, meaning a gene that causes lymphoma cells to grow called MYC, M-Y-C. Not by itself, but if another gene gets activated, and sometimes a triple gene, you have two or three, that's a little higher risk. And even sometimes there's a higher risk of having central nervous system involvement. It sounded like, Robin, it was more location uh, by the nose in that area. So sometimes if it's already there, uh, so that, that's something, just another uh, important nuance of managing lymphoma is, okay, yeah, it's diffuse RH B cell, but as we start to dive into the molecular of how does that impact treatment options, and it's, it's only going up, our knowledge base. We still have a lot of work to do, but we're really heading in the right direction. Yeah, and I think as, as we learn more and more, right, we'll find the right treatments for particular individuals, depending on what the overall uh, makeup of their disease might be, right? Um, and yeah, I think that's just so fascinating, right? How, how deeper and deeper we are getting into the research, both of the disease, but also, of course, the treatments. Um, and then, you know, if we can go back a little bit to CAR T and, and what Robin was saying in terms of um, cytokine release syndrome and you know side effects that she's experiencing. You no, know, and, and Dr. Evans, would you mind explaining what you know what cytokine release syndrome is and what's other common side effects of CAR T um, someone might experience as well? Sure, uh, I'll kind of break it really kind of three main main side effects. And and so 
Robin also did a great job of mentioning um, a couple different aspects. Because remember I said, once we take the cells and send it to the company, it's anywhere between three and five weeks. Well, some patients can't wait three or five weeks without any treatment. And so some patients can if it's smaller. So she mentioned the term bridging. And it's almost like a bridge of treatment during those three to five weeks while I'm waiting for the cells to come back. Um, so sometimes just the pill, uh, like a BTK, a brutinib, can it help? Well, sometimes you need a chemotherapy to do that. So that's one important thing to bridge. And then when, once the cells come back, the usual standard of care with the FDA-approved agents is it's three days of outpatient chemotherapy, low dose, but still chemotherapy. That not only kind of brings down the immune system so you can take the new immune cells, it actually helps them kind of slingshot up. So when you get the new cells, they come up over really one week period while you're in the hospital or sometimes even outpatient. But what can happen is it's still, even though it's very exciting, it's not a perfect science. So when you get these T cells back, they rapidly expand. And quite frankly, we don't know why in some patients is it a nice orderly normal expansion and they don't have a lot of side effects. And there's other patients by the second or third day, they have a massive expansion. So think of it like when you have the flu. You, it's in a way you're having an overreaction of your immune system. And that's why you have myalgias, headaches, fever, you feel terrible. So it's kind of like that. It's not exactly like that, where it's just an overexpansion of these cytokines, not just T cells and other. And when you have an overexpansion, it can cause fever, shortness of breath, low blood pressure. Thankfully, 99 plus percent of the time, we're able to manage it. Sometimes it can be a little tricky and patients even, um, thankfully it's minority, but have to go to the intensive care unit for fluids. There's a special inhibitor called tocilizumab. It blocks the cytokines. So we've gotten much, much better at treating that. So that's one important. The second is, and that usually happens earlier, kind of days three to six. Then a little bit later, kind of like I'll say, and there's wide intervals, confidence intervals I'm giving are overly tight right now. Then kind of days, let's say five to 10, there can be a neurologic toxicity where it can be as simple as just a little confusion. And then sometimes, thankfully, uncommonly, it can be almost like uh, almost like a stroke someone is having. They're word finding, they're confused, etc. Again, scary, but 99.9999% of the time, thankfully, reversible. We'll give steroids for that, just like we'll give steroids for COVID, uh, because that's almost treating an inflammatory situation. And we used to wait to give these because we didn't know would it harm the CAR-T. Now we're giving these kind of antidotes, tocilizumab, steroids, a little earlier, and we're able to really catch it early, so we try to avoid these side effects. And then the third side effect, that it's also transient, temporary, it's from the chemo, your immune system goes down and usually comes back up by the 10th day. There's a few patients who like, they'll leave, go, leave the hospital and then 10 days later, we don't know why, maybe a little bit gets stuck in the bone marrow, it can go down again, and then we have to go up. So just once you leave the hospital, that's a big, important breakthrough, but sometimes you still need to be, like uh, Robin mentioned, kind of within 30 minutes, 60 minutes, just to, in case there can be a late little bump in the road that we have to iron out. But those are the three. There, of course, are more side effects, but thankfully we've gotten very good at it. We know what to look for and really catch it early. Right. No, and thank, thank you for explaining that. And I think, you know, for a lot of patients, that might be something that weighs on them, right, as they consider any treatment options, especially for something so or relatively new, right? Um, but I think as we're learning more and more about CAR-T um, and, you know, ongoing research is happening, ideally, you know, newer generations, right, will, will lead to less side effects or much more manageable ones. Um, and so I'm wondering, Dr. Evans, if, if uh, you know, what do you think is, is the future of CAR-T, and um, especially in context of COVID-19, right? Um, and, and I don't know if you see any, any major difference in that, but, um, you know, what, what can patients hope for when, when we consider CAR-T as a treatment option for them? Yeah, Victor, we are 100% at the tip of the iceberg in a good way right now. We've got a lot of icebergs to, to find and to discover under the water that we're, we're doing uh, like uh, again on a daily, weekly basis. And so we'll talk mainly about lymphoma, but the one exciting thing about CAR T is it's being studied in almost every cancer under the sun because the whole concept of dysfunctional T cells, immune system, making them work better, tell them where to go, is true against across most cancers. So breast cancer, colon cancer, 
It's going to be harder in those, in a way. They're more heterogeneous cancers. Lymphoma tends to be, even though it can be resistant, more homogeneous. But, but that's one important point. It's being studied in multiple cancers. So if I was a patient with any cancer, yeah, and I was on clinicaltrials.gov, I'm looking for immunotherapy, novel therapy like that. But looking at lymphoma, so we currently have two agents approved currently as of today for diffuse RGB cell. As of just a couple weeks ago, we now have the one for mantle cell lymphoma, very important breakthrough there. But there are multiple other CAR-T products looking to be approved. And ones that we hope are um, not just similarly tolerated, uh, but are better tolerated. Right now, most CAR-T is given in the hospital. Some of these newer generations will be able to give it very possibly in the outpatient setting. Still need to be careful, but in the outpatient setting. And it's not, and we didn't even mention, I mentioned that we transfect an antibody onto the T cell. The one antibody we transfect, it's called CD19. That's on a B cell. We're talking some ad bills after CD20. But I don't want to compare it to Legos. Maybe not everyone will remember Legos. But it's almost like um, putting things together and creating, maybe we need a double CAR T where it has CD19 and CD20. Maybe it has a third receptor sticking out of it to go after it is, is one concept and constructs being studied in the laboratory and in clinics. The other is, let's just stay with the currently approved agents, the CD19. Well, you know, like CHOP, that's four drugs together. Well, can we start adding other novel agents to either make the CAR-T work stronger or less side effects? So, for example, the BTK inhibitors, we think having a, a favorable immune um, a, a component against the immune milieu. So can we start taking drugs like lenalidomide, uh, uh, BTK inhibitors, and actually start combining it carefully with these medications, to, again, to make it work better and, and possibly be less effective. And then the last thing I'll mention that's exciting, we've talked all about T cells. There's other immune cells, so natural killer cells. If any of us today get an infection, the first cell to that infection or cancer is a natural killer cell. They're like the Marines to our immune system. And so you can even manufacture the natural killer cells. You can, again, take them out of the body, transfect them, and tell them where to go. So could we be in a place where we literally mimic the immune system, where it's someone has cancer lymphoma, we'll give an NK um, car, we'll give a T car a few days later, and then bring in other immunotherapy. I didn't know that was going to be so it's a lot of you know, tools in our toolbox, and now we just have to make sure how it all works. And that's just fascinating, you know, to think that there's this whole well of potential treatment options. And, and I'm wondering, you know, for you, Robin, having been through that, like what, what what are you feeling right now when you hear all the different things that we are you know, learning about, what the future looks like? Um, you know, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Um, well, uh, I'm very grateful, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, for researchers. And I personally just uh, been raising money for medical research myself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I feel I can do to sort of give back. Um, I am, I run a group uh, for CAR-T patients and their caregivers online, a support group, so people can get information. Uh, you know, a lot of people are very concerned about getting these new therapies, and it's great to have encouragement. I, I actually had felt on my own that I thought this was the right thing, but I'm a little unusual because I'm in the medical field. And the other thing I think is so exciting that I've literally been part of the research uh, that is actually going to help so many other patients. Uh, I've said this before, I've, I've spent my entire life in medicine over 30 years, but probably my greatest contribution to medicine is not going to be as a practicing physician, but possibly as a patient, <laughs> but Hey, it's all good. And, yeah. uh, I'm just so excited because, again, I've been able to get my life back. I do have some side effects, mostly from the bone marrow transplant and the um, the radiation. Uh, there's a few things from CAR-T. Uh, they sort of, you know, I've had so many different therapies, my goodness, you know, 16 different chemos and such. So you sort of expect some, some side effects. But I really have a great quality of life, and I want that for other people. I really do. Uh, I just think life is wonderful, and I'm – I'm thankful to be enjoying it. So, Victor, I just want to thank Robin. Um, it's not in our list of questions that I'm so one for doing what you did and going through it and kind of going at the time out on a limb. Um, and you had hope 
and trust in the medical system. Now you are a physician yourself, but hopefully that resonates. But number two, you mentioned funding. And so thank you for that. And I, and I don't, I, I think, you know, it's tough because I, I mentioned a bunch of interesting, cool constructs and ideas. I can tell you, Victor, and you probably know this, Robin, the number one deficiency we have to making breakthroughs is not ideas, is not drugs. As of now, it's funding. That's our biggest barrier. And not to say it's easy, money doesn't grow on trees. And that was before COVID. You know, as you probably know, you know, most cancer labs across the world for they're just reopening now, got totally shut down. And understandably, a lot of funding is being diverted to COVID, needs to go there. But, you know, we're a little greedy when it comes to treating lymphoma and discoveries. Any little bit helps, you know, whether it's to your local institution, whether it's to lymphoma research, uh, LRF, Lymphoma Research Foundation. I know how much you guys, Victor, dedicate to funding young investigators, new treatment breakthroughs. So any little bit helps. And it's really fantastic. And I want to thank you for that, Robin. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I'm really glad. Uh, it means a lot. So, yeah. and, and likewise, Robin, I think, you know, you're, you're at a unique perspective, right? Having the physician knowledge and also the patient knowledge. And, um, you know, I think it's so interesting that you can speak to the different experiences, right? Um, so I think that's, you know, that's definitely a reason why we wanted to have you here today. And, and so patients and, and um, you know, even caregivers, survivors, anybody who's interested can really get a sense over, you know, all the different things that someone with, you know, the very background you have is, is, is thinking about and, and the faith that you put into research. You know, it, it is, you know, the main reason why we exist is to try to make sure that we move the needle in, in terms of the treatments that exist um, so that we can save lives, right? And that's ultimately the most important thing. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, if for those patients who maybe don't have that medical background, right, and who have very limited information, but they know that, you know, the physicians are thinking about CAR T, you know, if you can remove that part of you and just think of yourself as patient, Robin, you know, what, what advice would you give to them? The advice I give patients on my online Facebook help group is to go forward with CAR T. Ask your, your doctor all the questions that you have. Ask the people on the site, anybody you can talk to about the therapy. Lymphoma Research Foundation is quite unusual in that you actually have navigators and in many cases patients that will talk to other patients. And I think it helps alleviate people's fears. One of the things with clinical trials is people sometimes don't understand that clinical trials are often the most cutting edge therapy, the best you can get. And you're not being experimented on. You're actually getting the best. Uh, and they have to do these trials to make sure it's completely safe. But by the time it goes to trials, it is a safe therapy. And obviously, I'm biased, but I do encourage them. But I also tell them to ask questions, uh, talk to institutes like Lymphoma Research Foundation, and also even get second opinions. No physician is ever offended by a patient getting a second opinion from another institution. And I'm very excited, and I'm thank you for all the work that you guys do to help people. <laughs> No, and thank you as well. And, you know, the program that you were mentioning earlier about being connected with others is our very own lymphoma support network, which you are a member of. So we thank you for that as well. You know, where we match patients, caregivers and survivors with others who have been through a similar experience. And I think that certainly is a, a huge benefit to a lot of patients who just, you know, maybe they do have the support both from their physicians and their families, but they really want to speak to somebody who's been through it, right? Who's walked down that path. And that's the purpose of that program. Um, and as, you know, to provide that support, you know, and, and then for, for us uh, on the helpline, for example, is to provide the educational piece as well, um, including our in-person programs. You know, Dr. Evans, you've been a speaker at many of them as well, you know, and you know, we thank you for that as well. Just to make sure that patients are educated, right? And they, they make informed decisions and as much as possible um, have, you know, shared decision making, right? Because I think that's the important piece. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, I also wanted to just bring up um, that, CAR T is, you know, as Dr. Evans said, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's still so much beyond that. Um, and, you know, Dr. Evans, before we end, I, I wanted to know if, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about, you know, some other novel therapies that you find promising that, um, you know, maybe would be appropriate for someone beyond CAR T or even in combination with. I know, for example, 
Um, one of the most recent approvals we had was uh, Expovio or Solanexer. That seems, you know, really novel. Um, and also for DLBCL folks. And, you know, want to know if you wouldn't mind, you know, explaining it a little bit and what your thoughts are on these therapies. Sure. No, it's, you mentioned it. It's just, it's a, a kind of multiple recent breakthroughs. I mean, in, in the last few weeks, we've had two FDA approvals for relapsed diffuse arch B cell. Uh, one is cell in XOR that kind of targets the inner machinery of lymphoma cells. Um, and so we're, we're learning about that and, and how to do, use that. And then just literally five days ago, uh, tafasatmab, which is a CD19 antibody in combination with lenalidomide, a pill. So we know lenalidomide works a little bit. It didn't get approval into diffuse art B cell. It's approved in mantle cell and follicular lymphoma. But when you combine it, it was almost synergistic activity with this CD19 antibody. So as many things, and we alluded to that before, medications get approved relapsed and by themselves. So then we start to say, okay, how do we start moving them up and start combining them together? So, so those are ones that I think are very exciting. If I had to say what is next in the pipeline, it's always hard to predict. But there are these uh, agents called bispecific antibodies. And so it's another form of immunotherapy where it's an antibody to CD20, and then the other kind of antibody is CD3. What is CD3? Is it attracts T cells? So instead of taking T cells out and re-injecting them, it tries to drag your T cells in a way, simplistic way, to the lymphoma. And actually, at our last ASH meeting in December, every uh, all the world's hematologists meet uh, every December, that was one of the plenary sessions. The title of it was Activity, and I'm summarizing, Activity of bispecific in patients where CAR T actually has not worked. So it even works in CAR T where, situations where it's not. So again, just a lot of breakthroughs. And, and I echo what, what Robin said. You know, I mentioned I had several telemedicine consults this morning. I can tell you at the end of that, I'm, I'm being very serious, uh, you know, because I'm able to share my screen. I wrote down three letters, LRF. Actually, I take that back. I wrote your website, lymphoma.org. Uh, um, but I said it stands for it's for LRF because you are a rich resource and, and knowledge is power. And so understanding about the disease and understanding about the options, understanding about specialties. And you do, you guys do a fantastic job of navigating patients through that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, you know, I think we're particularly proud of the information, the quality of the information and the accuracy that we're able to provide to patients. Um, you know, we have disease-specific and treatment-specific learning centers on our website, as well as publications that patients can all access for free, um, and all in the spirit of making sure that they're as educated as possible and they're up to date on some of these, you know, exciting advances that are relevant to them. Um, and for us, you know, it's what gets, gets us up in the morning, right, and get, gets us excited to go to work, and making sure that, you know, um, patients are getting the information they need and, and caregivers as well, too. You know, I think I want to give them a shout out as well, because I think for a lot of folks, you know, they, they do a lot of the work um, as, as you know, the patient tries to get better. And, and I think um, as a whole, you know, um, whatever we can do as a foundation and as individuals to make sure that we um, help patients get the information they need so that they get the treatments we need, you know, um, is, is what's important. Right. Um, so, well, I think we're at time almost. So I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Evans and Robin uh, as well for joining us today and sharing your both knowledge and experiences. It's been a true pleasure having you and we really appreciate your support um, on behalf of LRF. Um, I also want to thank all our listeners um, as well for joining us and, and please stay tuned for our next podcast. But for anyone who has any questions on anything we spoke about today, whether it's CAR-T, novel therapies, diffuse arch B cell lymphoma, uh, we encourage folks to contact us um, either through our website at lymphoma.org or to call the helpline at 1-800-500-9976 or email at helpline at lymphoma.org. Uh, so thank you both once again, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your days.